And tonight, what our task is, is to look at the last year. And it's hard to believe that we're at 2022 and another year has gone past. And in many ways, I think that this last year uh, has actually been a harder year than perhaps the year before was, uh, with all the things that have happened uh, during this year. And one of the things I think that um, that's the reason, the reason that is, is because there was this anticipation, wasn't there, that 2020 happened this unbelievable year, and that if we could just get through 2020, we could, we could get life back to normal. And there was all these you know, memes on the internet at the end of 2020 that you know, 2020 is gone and we're bringing in 2021. And hopefully everything's going to get back to normal and life will be as it once was. But that wasn't the case, was it? And the world has felt the effects, the long-term effects of what was 2020. And I, I kind of like this meme, um, which I found which was from the start of, two, well, once 2021 started to get going, I think people quickly realised that uh, that wasn't going to be the case. And there's been some long-term changes in the world, haven't there, as a result of what happened in 2020. And that's usually the case when there's a big um, change in the world. And I thought what we'd do is to start, just to, to think about that, is to think about perhaps, and, I, and I've chosen three myself, but if you were to think of over the last 100 years, the three years that have been perhaps some of the most um, pivotal years in human history, I wonder what years you would choose. And so I'll ask you that question. The last 100 years, if you were to choose three years, not including 2020, that have had a major effect on the world, uh, what year would you choose? 1929, very good. That is my first year on the list. And the reason why I had 1929 is on the list is because 1929 is famous for the stock market crash in New York. And why that was such a significant and interesting event was, of course, within 1929, it caused um, substantial economic trouble, not only in America, but those effects quickly flowed to other parts of the world, um, namely Europe, and started to have some major effects on that. Interestingly, if you look at the stock market crash of 1929, uh, the, um, the, the average um, value of the stock market did not return to its same value until the mid-1950s. Right? That's how significant the crash was of 1929. It took all that time, right, 25 years, for the price to come back to what it was on average. But of course, there were long-term effects of that particular uh, event. And one of the major ones was the Great Depression, which set in within America and, of course, all different parts of the world. And that Great Depression set in in Europe. And in particular, the Depression started to undermine already social unrest, which was in Germany. And, of course, Hitler used that as one of the key ways to manipulate the people and to get his power into party. And then, of course, World War II flowed from there. And World War II, of course, had massive ramifications upon the world. But one of the key ramifications that resulted in World War II was, of course, the return of Israel to the land of Israel and the establishment of the state of Israel. And that was 20 years after what happened in 1929. And so the, the, the events that rocked the world in 1929 the events that happened as a result were far-reaching. And that's interesting to think about, isn't it? What's another year? I've got three. Absolutely brilliant. What happened in 1969, before you look at the pictures? Man on the Moon. Man on the Moon, OK? Now, that was just one of the many significant events that happened in 1969. And I suppose this one's a little bit hard. You could say, nine, sometimes people say 1967 was a really significant year because there was a lot of things that happened. 
but 1969 as well, right? There was Woodstock. There was the political upheaval about the Vietnam War. And probably what all of those things, you got Abbey Road from the Beatles was released. And you've got all these things which resulted in really this cultural revolution which began to happen particularly in the Western world. And the effects of that cultural revolution, a complete change in the new generation and how they were going to view things. And, and there was a, a number of reasons why, why that was the case. Probably unrest from still the, the ramifications of World War II, but there was a group and a generation of people that wanted to look at the world in a different place and a different way. And one of the things which happened as a result of that in the West was the breaking down or the, or the, the, the turning away of biblical godly principles in people's lives. And that started largely in this cultural revelation, revolution which happened in the 60s. Now, the ramifications of what happened then are still happening in our world today. And we feel the effects of what happens all the way back there. Because when major events or significant years happen in the world, they have long-term consequences both individually, as families, and geopolitically, within nations. Our last one, we've already been told about, was 2001. And for many of, this, many of us uh, here, we can remember that one quite vividly. I can still remember exactly where I was and exactly where I went when those towers fell down. And wasn't it an incredible thing to witness? And when you were watching them, and I remember I watched live as the, second, um, as the second tower was hit by the plane, and then watched live on TV as both of those towers fell to the ground, you knew when you were watching that happen that the world would never be quite the same again. That, this, that there was something that had changed in the world that would never come back. And one of those was that it's an absolute nightmare to go, for the, to go to the airport and travel internationally from then on because you have to just basically completely get undressed and remove everything before you can get onto the plane. But there's been far more significant things as a result of what's happened in 2001 that have happened in the world since. And one of the things that happened was that there was a war on terror. And then the Americans went into Iraq and then they went into all different parts of um, the Middle East. But I think what we've seen from then, which is really interesting, is we've seen perhaps the, the breakdown or the control of the American superpower over the world has slowly started to diminish. And even this very year, and we'll look at this a little bit later on, about when Af America removed and, and removed itself and its army from Afghanistan, that was a result of what happened in 2001. And so when major things happen upon the world, there are things that, ramifications, there are social changes, there are political changes that affect the world for years to come. And that's no different to 2020. And although the world, or perhaps even us personally sometimes, felt that at the end of 2020, we would love to have just gone back to where it was before and I could use my frequent flyer points and I could get in a plane whenever I wanted, I could travel to Europe or I could travel to different parts of the world and I could do it easily and I had all this, these things. Unfortunately, those things we've discovered in 2021 are not going to so quickly move back to where they were. But that's okay because we ultimately don't have to worry about that. Because we're here tonight to look at what God says about the world. And what God says about the world is that I have a plan and I had a plan from the very beginning. And my plan from the very beginning was to create a kingdom upon earth. And a key ingredient of that kingdom upon earth is that Jesus Christ will return and he will establish a kingdom upon it and he will be king. And that plan has not changed. 
And we've got to be careful when we look at big events like what happened in 2020 and like the virus which is still ravaging in the world and having an impact on our life. We've got to be careful that we don't either see it as something too big or something too small. Because God will use the events that happen upon the world to continue his plan. And that is unchanging. And that is not stopped. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're simply going to just have a look at a few things, a few of the key events that happened in 2021. And we'll see how those things fit into God's overall plan. And whilst the world is in turmoil around, God's plan continues to move to its conclusion. Now, when Jesus left this world, he told his servants that he would return. But he told them that he would never tell them the exact day nor hour in which they, he would return. That would always be a secret. But he didn't leave his servants in the dark. He gave them a road map, a set of events to look for, a set of circumstances in which the world would find itself to watch for in the world around them so that when his return came, it wouldn't be a complete surprise. Now, as a summary, I just want to go through a few maps because what these maps depict for us, many of us will be familiar with these, is what Jesus, well, what the Bible said the state of the world would be like on his return. And this is taken from a prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 38. Right? And these are ancient names on the map. But this is a conflict which the Bible describes would come upon the world at the time of the end. And so we should look and see in our world to see the circumstances we find our world in and see whether they start to fit the circumstances which we've been told about on this map. So in Ezekiel chapter 38, as a, th as a summary, the Bible says that there will be a conflict before the return of Jesus to the earth. And this conflict will surround this area of the Middle East and in principle, this nation of Israel. And Ezekiel chapter 38 says that there will be a northern country who will be confederate with a whole lot of these other countries here named in red. And those countries will be antagonistic towards Israel at some point before Jesus returns to the earth. These countries in blue, we're also told in Ezekiel chapter 38, will be opposed to this conflict which will take place. Nations like Australia and America and Britain, Middle Eastern countries like Dubai and Saudi Arabia and some of the other peninsular um, Arab nations and countries like England. These nations will oppose what will happen at this time of the end. But despite that opposition, the prophecy tells us that this northern power will come down and strike the nation of Israel and inflict a great wound upon it. And it will be that that will be the catalyst to bring about Jesus Christ's return to the earth. Now, we just want to look at a few events from this year and see how our world has changed and perhaps see how some of the pieces of that puzzle have begun to be closer into focus. The first thing that's happened, of course, number one, is COVID. It's hard to pick up a newspaper or go onto your phone or turn on the TV or the radio and escape the just apocalypse of news which is, surrounds us every day about COVID. But I think this map is actually, this chart here, it depicts 2021 fairly well. This is the end of 2020. And although 2020, there was this rise in, and this is, you know, cases and uh, a collection of cases throughout the whole world. Although there was this sort of ever-growing mountain at 2020, there was hope at the end of 2020 that we had reached a peak and we were going to come down. But this has been the story, hasn't it, of 2021. As people have tried to come to grips with this thing in different parts of the world, there's been hope for a minute and then it disappears. 
And then there's been hope for a bit more and then it disappears. And we've gone through this roller coaster of up and down. Some places experiencing more severe lockdowns, others less severe lockdowns. But as a whole, a very unstable time and place to live. And what that's seen, I think, is then unrest in the world. And most places have seen this unrest in their own streets. This is a picture from where I live, which is um, in Melbourne. And this was pretty, a from pretty familiar scene if you went anywhere through the CBD uh, through the three or four months through the centre of this year. And so the world has been racked with controversy, hasn't it? Not only about the virus itself and how to deal with the virus and how to get on top of the virus, but then it's been racked with controversy when it's come with trying to, when trying to roll out the vaccines. And the world has been, been, the rolling out of vaccines has been met with controversy and it's been met with protest. Some wishing not to be vaccinated or not to have that forced upon them. Other people protest, protesting at the lack of government ability to roll these things out quick enough. And it's created divisions. And what we've seen, I think, when you look at the world and what's happened as a result of that, we've seen a continual polarisation polarization and division amongst nations. As people have looked after their own interests first. first. And nations like Australia, we're, we're in one of those lucky countries, aren't we, where we are extremely, unbelievably rich. And we were able to, by writing cheques in our chequebook, we were able to get access to the, the, the quickest and the greatest vaccines possible. And when we realised pretty early into the game that we got the wrong vaccine, we pull out the chequebook again and we write more cheques to get more vaccines and get them over here quickly. And we're some of the fortunate ones, aren't we? Who have been able to dictate our terms and how we wanted things to work. And so we were able to structure things unbelievably to, to work out exactly how we want to do it. But even within a rich country like Australia, we've had division and polarisation, even within our own country. And so we have states running their own show and deciding what they're going to do for their populations. And so the world, I think, as a result of COVID, has moved further and further and further apart from each other. And people have looked after their own interests. And unfortunately, the nations that go by the wayside are always those that, with no money, aren't they? And, and countries in Africa, and we've seen India, these are where these new variants came out, and largely as a result of very, very low vaccination rates as the disease um, went rampant through those places. I was speaking to a, a good friend of mine who's from Sri Lanka recently, and I was talking to him about COVID. And he said one of the ramifications for his family as a result of COVID has not been worrying about the cases or you know, ch checking the statistics, but because of the, the way that disease has raged through their population and killed many people and had a massive economic effect upon their nation, one of the things that his family over in Sri Lanka has had to do is decide to drop one meal a day out of what they give their family because of the economic effects it's had upon the everyday economy of those people. And we don't often think, I don't think about those kind of ramifications for us because we are given so much money and handed out so much money from our government. But that's been one of the real consequences of different places around the world. So COVID has caused polarisation, it's caused segregation, it's caused nations to look after their own. And we've seen that with nations looking after their economies and, and the health of their particular nations. Interesting observation from The Economist from 2020 when this whole thing was starting to un unveil itself. He said this, the pandemic is in effect telescoping the future. Trends that might have taken five or ten years to play out have unfolded in only five to ten weeks and all point to the same direction, to a world turning further inward. And I think that's an astute observation from mid-2020 and that trend has continued. As nations have begun to look further inward to look after themselves, 
even some of the largest economies of the world. And it's created all sorts of um, problems in globalisation, hasn't it? Things that we just took for granted a couple of years ago, where because we're part of this network around, a world, around the world of globalisation, we've got our goods coming from China and we've got different things coming from Europe and America, and that, that world worked seamlessly until all of a sudden it didn't. And now we can't get anything from off the shelves because all of a sudden globalisation has created this enormous problem. This is an image taken from that particular article, and I think that represents quite well what the world is beginning to look like. Rather than one globe where everyone's operating harmoniously, we've got a group of nations now who are operating separately and looking after their own interests. Now, why is that significant to us, and how does that work into God's plan? Well, of course, God's plan has been unveiling itself for all of history. And in Daniel chapter 2, there's a prophecy of that the man Nebuchadnezzar received, and he was given, if you like, a visual timeline of how the world would unra unra unravel itself and show itself. And this vision of this man was made up of these one, two, three, four, five different metals. And each of those metals represented a different empire or period of time which had come upon the world. So we had the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. And finally, after the Roman Empire, this, the world, we were told, would be represented by um, these feet made up of iron and made up of clay. And when we zoom in on that period of time, Daniel says in Daniel chapter 2 that this is what the world in symbol would look like when Jesus Christ would return to the earth. He said it would look like feet made of iron and clay. And he says, as the toes of the feet, feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And in that you saw iron mixed with wet clay, so people will be mixed with one another without adhering to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And so the empire described at the time of the end, when Jesus Christ would return to the earth, would be a divided empire. A world made up of divided kingdoms, who no matter how much they tried to join themselves together, would never completely do it. And that's the world that we live in today. And it's remarkable how similar our world is starting to look to that depiction described in Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel was told that in the days of those kings, when you see the world looking the way of the feet of iron and clay, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And our world continues to look very much like that symbol of feet of iron and clay. The other thing I think we've seen that's significant this year has been the rise of the East. We've seen China stamp its authority upon the world. And we've felt that quite closely here in Australia, haven't we? Where China has almost used Australia as a test case to bully a nation and show a nation like Australia and the rest of the world how serious they are about the decisions they make and the power that they have. And so Australia has been restricted from you know, trading in certain of its commodities with China, or China's tried to do that to us, to restrict um, you know, different trading partners in order to bring about pressure upon them. And there's been a power struggle, hasn't there, between East and between West, between America and between China. And whereas China, probably for the last 20 or 30 years, has always seen itself as perhaps the new up-and-coming kingdom, the new up-and-coming superpower, there's very much a feel from, first, from uh, 2021 that China is arrived and it's starting to feel very much an equal of the US. This is what, in December 2020, so just a couple of weeks ago, this is what uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said in relation to China and America, in relation to the nation of Taiwan. China said, 
China's complete unif unification is an unstable historical trend that cannot be changed by any person, any force or any country. We urge the United States, States to take seriously China's position and concerns and be cautious with its words and deeds in Taiwan-related issues. Stop military contracts with Taiwan, stop developing substantial relations with Taiwan and stop spending, sending wrong signals to Taiwan Taiwan independent forces. So China has started to very forcefully come out and make these statements against America, and it's particularly in relation to Taiwan. If you know about what's happened with Taiwan, Taiwan's a little nation which is a breakaway island from China, and it once was part of mainland China, but it sits now as a, as a separate republic of its own. But China, just like it did with Hong Kong, which if you know of anything that's happened with Hong Kong over the last couple of years, Hong Kong has slowly been brought under the wing of complete control of China, and China wants to do the same with Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is a very, very close partner with America. And so this year, we've seen all of that start to come to a head, hasn't we? As, as America defended or began to defend very heavily what America was doing, and then we've got China making statements like this, uh, which is you know, pushing back at American power. And so we find America now in the world in a very difficult situation. And it started to move its attention back to this area of the Pacific. And we've seen some of the things that America have been doing this year that have made that the case. So America, whilst China has been rising, America has started to have some significant troubles. And of course, you know, Donald Trump has been one of the significant players in those troubles and instability over the last few years. And we saw him at the start, it seems like, to me it seems like that was five years ago when Trump left the office. But that was only the start of 2021, January last year, where Trump left the Oval Office in a, just a, a pall of controversy as people um, rioted and um, went into Capitol Hill. Um, in protest of what they believe to be a rigged election. And Donald Trump walked out the door uh, at, the end of, at the end of January in 2021. And then Joe Biden came in. And this is a picture of Joe Biden um, in the first few months of his presidency, tripping as he went up the, um, the stairs to get to the Air Force One. And perhaps that image has represented Joe Biden's presidency to this point. He's a man of 78 years of, years of age, and he's clearly struggled with some of the demands of the presidency over the last year. And he's perhaps been a symbol, almost, of the current condition of America and the current condition of America's power in the world that many believe is uh, not what it once was. And perhaps one of the events that happened upon the world which uh, symbolised that more than any was in the middle of the year when America decided it was going to move out of Afghanistan. And it's been in Afghanistan for many years and in many ways it was a symbolic entry into, if, into Afghanistan to prove and to show the world that what happened in 2001 and September 11 would never ever happen again. And we watched, the world watched in awe as America retreated from Afghanistan and almost overnight, the Taliban, which it had been warring and fighting with for years, moved straight back in and took complete control. And it was just a, a picture of debacle, wasn't it, as America exited via its air force from the, from the, from the, um, the airport in, effect, if, in Afghanistan. And it was almost a symbol, again, of the reduction in the power of America. And so then America has tried to move and pivot and, and go back to some of its traditional allies to secure some key elements of power in the world. And one of those, as we said, was this area of the Pacific. It realises with China being a growing threat in that particular area, it needs to shore up its power. And so Australia was involved, wasn't it, with uh, the UK in this new defence agreement, which was called AUKUS which was a sharing of defence between some of these nations in reply to the growing power of a nation like China in the East. And this was a great press conference, wasn't it? Because um, 
Joe Biden couldn't even remember our Prime Minister's name throughout the, the whole um, press conference. This is what The Economist said on September 19. In relation to this renewal of close ties between Australia, America and Britain, just occasionally you can see the tectonic plates of geo geopolitics shifting in front of your eyes. The Suez in 1956, Nixon going to China in 1972 and the fall of Ball the Berlin Wall in 1989 are among the examples uh, among the examples in living memory, the unveiling last week of a trilateral defence pact between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States, introducing an awkward acronym, the awkward acronym of AUKUS, is providing another one of those rare occasions. So there are significant changes in the world with America going back to some of these traditional allies. And the reason why that's the case is because that whole thing, and we know because we were involved in it with the submarine thing, what, who did that annoy? It annoyed the Europeans. Because what we're seeing is America moving away from some of its entrenched European allies, like France and like Germany, and moving closer back to Britain and America, as, sorry, Britain and Australia as some of the key um, allies mil militarily. The, the, the Economist went on in a podcast in relation to that particular article to talk about three things, key things, that are going to happen or questions that need to be answered about America's current pivot towards the east. It says, can America contain China? Even with all of the defence that America is bringing in to the Pacific area, can they contain the might and the, the enormity of China? What is America's future role in Europe? It's, it's spread itself so wide. Like, it's in America, yet it wants to be in the Pacific and it also wants to be in Europe. But that's such a huge divide for a nation like America to try and bridge and be the policeman in the world like it has been for the last 50 years. And will Europe be able to stand on its own? So there's this growing trend of Europe moving away from America and beginning to look after itself in the world. And why is that significant? Well, we looked at our map at the start and we said that there would be a group of nations in the end times which would oppose this northern confederacy that would come down. And that group of nations is called the Merchants of Tarshish. And we believe those nations to be connected with Britain and Australia and America. And so the further tying together and the bringing together of those alliances is further proof of the continuation of God's plan upon the earth. And the other thing that's significant is in that prophecy, when they do provide some kind of um, you know, block to the northern power coming down, it's not one of any significant power. They say, have you come to take a spoil? Like, are you going to come down? What are your attentions? We want to know what you're going to do. And then the northern power just rushes down over the top of them. So we would expect from that that a nation like America, who has been the key economic and military power in the world, we might expect that that would be continually to continue to be challenged. And I think that we've started to see that in the world just in the last 12 months. What about Russia? Well, I think that's a good picture of um, Putin, he always takes a great photo, doesn't he? He's always keen to have his photo taken and that photo was taken uh, towards the start of the year when he was in Siberia having one of his holidays down there. And the brilliant thing about Putin is, despite what goes on in the world, he just continues business as usual. And he seems to be working on a long-term agenda. And one of the reasons that why that's the case is because he's been in power for so long. And this is a photo of him giving the thumbs up when earlier this year he signed the new set of contracts which gave him the ability to stay in power until uh, 2036. He was in power, I think, from the start in 1997. So if he does keep going till 2036, that's an enormous amount of time that one man has been in power. But you see what the ability that that gives a, na a president like Russia in the world, or any president or any leader of a nation. And it's the same with China. They have the ability to do long-term planning and to think 
strategically about what they want to do and the nations they want to ally with and how they'll bring about that plan over a very, very long period of time. Whereas countries like Australia and America are very limited in what they can do. America, this year, will go through its midterm elections. Right? And they will bring further um, division within the nation. And, and America just seems to be continuously in this ever going on to, um, set of elections. Yet people like Russia, nations like Russia, are able to plan long term. I reckon this photo is interesting. That, well, photos. This is a photo of Putin as he slowly worked through five presidents of the United States. And you think about all these years of time, I mean, Bill Clinton, when he was in the world in power, that just seems like so long ago. And Putin was there shaking his hand. And then George Bush came to power. And we had eight years of George Bush, two whole presidential terms of George Bush. And Putin was there shaking his hand the whole time. And then we had Obama, who was going to change the world and he was going to do new things and the whole world was going to come together. And Putin saw him come and he saw him go. And then the same with Trump, as Trump sort of turned the whole world upside down, turned the whole of the United States upside down. And Putin was there and he saw him come and he saw him go. And he's the next president. You can just see on the face of Putin there. He just knows, doesn't he? Right? He just looks at these guys and thinks, you're going to be around for two seconds. And you're going to come in and you've got all these great ideas and you're going to do all these things. And I just keep moving on and plotting on with what I'm doing and what I'm planning and continuing to drive his agenda. And that's what he's been doing this year. And one of the key things he's done this year is continue to drive his gas empire. He's built the gas empire over the last 20 years. And what he's aimed to do with this gas empire, and this is Nord Stream 2, which is the latest one of his huge pipelines that run gas from Russia right into Europe. One of, his, one of the main things that he's trying to do is control the energy in Europe. And once you've got control, you've got power. And that's what he's continued to do in the world. And he has been getting very vocal lately, hasn't he? In his contentious actions in the Ukraine. And here's a photo just taken a couple of weeks ago from Sun Satellite from America of the build up of troops on the border of the Ukraine. And Putin has very much made clear that those troops are there and they're sitting there with a very clear agenda. And what that agenda is, is these nations here in blue are all the European nations which have signed on to NATO. And what NATO is, is an alliance of nations who have all got together and said, if anyone, if, if Russia ever attacks us, we will all get together and defend ourselves. And that pact was put in place not, far, not too long after World War II. And slowly, America has been pushing this blue line closer to, Iraq, to, closer to Russia. And they're in talks with the Ukraine now to get them to sign on to this, this NATO pact. And Russia doesn't like it. And I can understand why. Because as soon as a nation becomes part of NATO, America moves in and they put a set of missiles right along this border here. And if they get the Ukraine, that's what they're going to do there as well. And so Putin says, no, I'm not going to allow it. And I've got my troops right up here. And if you think you're going to walk into a Ukraine, you've got another thing coming. And that's what he's been saying over the last couple of weeks. He's been saying to America, just cross that line. And I'll go in and I'll take the Ukraine. And why is he so confident about that? He knows now how stretched America are. He knows after... Putin has just done a very, very great deal with the Chinese to lengthen and increase the power of their alliance together. He knows that there's no way that America now has the power to take on China in the east, all the way over to Russia over in the west. There's no way that he has the, they've got the power to do that. And so he's standing his line. And we're watching that nation of Russia increase its power and influence in the world. And why is that significant? Well, we saw from the start that Russia was one of the key nations that was going to come down into the world and it was going to exercise its authority over the world. And it was going to come in and strike this nation of Israel. This is a map from 2008. And this shows the agenda of someone like Vladimir Putin. It's not something that he's just thought of instantly. 
In 2014, he moved into the Ukraine and took this area of Crimea. Then in 2015, he came down and built a permanent base in Syria and still has those permanent bases in Syria. And he aligned himself with Turkey, Iran and Iraq. And these became his partners in this area of the Middle East when Syria was in crisis. And he's since done military alliances with Libya and with Sudan. We've then seen the United Kingdom in 2016 break off and become separate from Europe. And we've seen in 2020 and 2021 these pipelines coming from Russia into Europe. And so you can see over that period of time that Russia has had this long-term agenda of gaining this power further into these areas. And now we're seeing this area of the Ukraine coming under contact, into contact. And you can see when you compare that to our map from Ezekiel chapter 38, and I'll go back to the one of, of the map now, and then you look at Ezekiel chapter 38, that we are moving, aren't we, towards what the Bible said the world would look like when Jesus Christ returned. And the Bible said that in the end time, that Russia would move down quite swiftly into the nation of Israel. And so we need to be watching about the plan of what Israel says. Israel, uh, it, it, Russia would think an evil thought and come down and strike the nation of Israel. The last one we'll look at is COP26. And this is, of course, the climate change, um, uh, the, the, the climate change agenda which the world has to try and change the world. And there was this huge conference in Glasgow on the 26th of October where the nations of the world tried to get together to say, what can we do about solving our problems? And this is one of the key problems that the world sees, that the world is, has, the effect of mankind upon the world has ruined certain parts of the environment and they need to take steps to make those changes. But the outcome of the conference was fairly disappointing, probably to say the least. Some of these key guys that were at the conference says the problem is that not a single country has the short term policies in place to put itself on a trajectory to net, to net, zero, net zero. There's nearly one degree gap between the government current policies and their net zero goals. In other words, the outcome of that particular conference was every nation was looking after its own agendas. And a nation like Australia, who's very heavily reliant upon exports like coals and coal and iron ore and other fossil fuels, of course, is going to look after their own agenda. And trying to bring all these nations together to come upon a decision to try and curb just the smallest amounts of fossil fuels is proving extremely difficult. And so at the end of it, this is a cartoon of Boris Johnson waving goodbye as all the, the private jets left the place and all the tech billionaires left, left from giving their special speeches and ultimately achieved very little. And I suppose it shows, doesn't it, the inequality in the world. And one side of it, we've got the world trying to address these huge, enormous issues, but then we look we look at the, another part of the world where you've got these same billionaires who were some of the people giving the keynote addresses at these speeches who are just one or two of them going up by themselves in these huge rockets up to space for space tourism. And they plan next year to do the same thing and keep rolling that out. And, and the world looks upon this and sees the hypocrisy of this, of the world trying to solve these problems, but at the same time, almost finding it in, impossible to to, to fix the problems that the world has. David Attenborough, summing up the events of the conference, says this. Is this how the story is due to end? A tale of the smartest species doomed by that all too human characteristic of failing to see the bigger picture in the pursuit of short term goals. And I guess if you look at the Bible, that's a fairly accurate depiction of what mankind is often like. He's selfish and greedy and often looks to his own pursuits and his own agenda far before the rest of the world. And so the whole of that COP26 ended with a sum up from the CEO of the whole organisation 
and it ended with him in tears as he tried to bring something positive out of what they'd brought for that whole time. And I guess that's just an indication, just in one small example, of the world trying to grapple with the enormity of the problems which they have. But that reading which we read tonight outlined that the Bible says there's only one solution for a world and the sum of its problems, and that is the return of Jesus. And this is an excerpt from our reading that we read, which relates quite well to the environmental problems which the world has. It says, For he delivers the needy when he calls. The poor and him, and this is talking about Jesus, who will be future king of the world, who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continuously and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land and on the tops of the mountain may it wave. May its fruits be like Lebanon and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. So this is a depiction of the kingdom of God where there will be one ruler who rules justly and equally and provides for all men and all nations upon the earth. And so there's just four things that we've looked at tonight which have shaped perhaps 2021 and perhaps give us a picture into 2022 of what, what might come about. And we'll just summarise with three points that perhaps you can take away from tonight and take away as we look into 2021. And I guess perhaps this is the most important thing to think about as we set about on a new year. What are you going to change and what can you learn from the world that we live in right now that can affect your life? Well, I'll give something from my life. I think one of the things that, for me, I want to make sure I don't do is what we spoke about at the very start of our class tonight. And that is that there was this appetite, wasn't there, in 2020, end of 2020, when we came into 2020, that we wanted to go back to life as usual. And I wanted to be able to click my fingers so that I could just go back to doing the same things as I was doing before. If there's one lesson that I want to learn about everything that's happened over the last two, th two years is I don't want to go back to my life as usual. I want to try and learn the lessons which I've tried to be taught, have tried to be taught to me over the last two years. And I want to try and live more in the everyday and the simplicity which God has told me in the Bible in my life. And you know what? In life, and I suppose my, my life is 43 years long, you don't get many opportunities that come in life that are big enough to make you want to change something in your life. And we've certainly all felt what's happened in the world to us. And so there's an opportunity to make those changes in our own life. For me, we were in lockdown for 280 days. And one of the things that I enjoyed about that with my family was actually spending time with them quietly and being able to build up a routine of, of just reading the Bible together at night without the rush of life running past at a million miles a day, every single day, and build, being able to build in some kind of simple routine to what I do. And perhaps you might want to think about some of those things for your own life as well. The other thing that I want to try and do is be more patient. And the book of James talks about patience. And it says, if you're waiting for the kingdom of God, remember the farmer... Remember the farmer, he takes his seed and he, he takes out his seed and he, he throws the, the seed in, into, the, into the ground. And then he waits, doesn't he? And he waits months and, and he sees the, the, the wind come across and the weather come across and the rain come down upon the, upon the ground. And then he sees the sun come up and the storm and the rain. And then there's a process that happens over time as the seasons move and the seasons change. And all those things are bringing about the growth of the seed. And James says, that's like the purpose of God coming to pass. And sure as that seed eventually brings forth its fruit, 
So James says the kingdom of God and God's plan and purpose with this earth will be unfolded and will come to pass. And so we need to have patience. And patience, a definition of, a definition of patience is the endurance that you can stand before pressure comes into your life and you lose patience. And that's what can happen in our life when things like this come upon them. The third and final thing that perhaps we can learn from the last two years and take away with us in the year to come is that the world is an unstable place. And though, although the last 30 or 40 years, there's probably been relative st instability, instability has been the norm for most of humankind. And so we shouldn't be surprised when the world that we live in is unstable and conditions are changing every day. But what that gives us an opportunity to do is it gives us an opportunity to tell people about the stability that's going to come upon the world. And perhaps right now, in the world in which we live in, there's an opportunity better than there has been for many, many years to actually talk to people about what we believe is the future for the world. And perhaps that's why God has brought about or, been, or, or is using the events of these last couple of years to do, to soften the years that we might be able to speak to them. So we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening and um, I wish you all the best for 2022.